Welcome, Breakline. I'm so excited to spend the next 45 minutes with you and our community and our special guest. We know her as the CEO of YouTube, the 16th Google employee and the landlord to Google's first office, which was located in her garage. Today, we'll also have a chance to hear about some of the most consequential decisions of her career. She developed the first Google Doodles, the temporary alterations of the Google logo to highlight holidays, historical events and achievements. She also had the insight for AdSense, the product which generated $100 billion in revenue for Google in 2018. While running Google videos, she became the primary advocate for acquiring YouTube, a move that has been called the best acquisition of all time. Please join me in welcoming this outstanding leaner, leader to the Breakline Arena. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for having me, Bethany. Welcome, Susan. It's such a treat to have you with us today. And I'd love to dive right in. Um, I'm going to ask a series of questions. We also have questions from our audience that we're, um, that we're prepared to ask on their behalf as well. But I want to roll it back. Um, you were Google's 16th employee and held a lot of roles over the years. You've said many times that you were willing to do whatever it took. Um, for the company to succeed. And, um, and so I'd love for you to share advice that you might have for our break liners who are navigating their way through organizations and through these moments of career transition as well. Sure. Uh, yeah, so that was a while ago. I had just graduated from business school and uh, I was trying to figure out you know, where I was going and what I wanted to do. And what I what really attracted me to to Google at the time it was a really small company and you know people always ask me like why did you decide to go to Google uh, like no one had heard of it it had no revenue at the time it had very small set of users and it was really a few things which is first of all it had a product I really believed in and it had a mission which actually it's the same mission today which is to organize the world's information to make it universally accessible and useful. And I had the same mission and I really believed in the product. I, I, I like the product. I like the people. I like the mission. And, um, and that, and it was growing. Um, that's the other thing too. Like, even though no one had heard of it, when I looked at the metrics, I was like, wow, these are, this is like going somewhere. Cause this is a, this is uh these numbers are going up and to the right, which is where they're supposed to go. And so uh, I felt like, it was personally motivating to me and it looked like there was a, a value that it was adding to society and it was filling a real need. And so that's just been some advice I've given to people is to find something you really believe in that you, you, know, you want to be there. You enjoy the environment. You feel like you're doing something that's meaningful for the, for the world and, or for your customer base. And, um, and that also it's going the right way, right? So the growth is, so for, particularly for tech companies, you want to look and see, is there growth in this company? If it's not growing right now, it's it's less likely it will be growing in the future. If it's growing now when you're joining it and, and looking to join, it will most likely continue in the future. And Susan, I, as I was preparing for this conversation, I was listening to some podcasts and you, you were describing the collection of folks around the table in those early days. And you said, you know, none of us had any ad experience. And yet we decided we were going to launch this new platform. Can you talk a little bit about how that was an advantage, you know, to come in with just a, a fresh perspective on and a new way to solve a problem? Yes, for sure. So I, I think in technology, uh, it's important to remember that a lot of there's a lot of innovate, innovation and there are a lot of new ideas and there's a lot of ways that um, that things need to be redone. And so so and there's an opportunity for for um, whatever it is, whether it's advertising or media or I don't know, something in like you know, approach to medical, like, because you have technology, it can be done in a different way. Um, and there are new benefits and there are new ways to measure it and new ways to serve your, your clientele. And so in many ways, it helped us a lot that none of us actually knew anything about the existing industry that we were able to just rethink it. Um, so just to be more specific in advertising, beforehand, there hadn't been as much transparency. There was like this old saying in advertising that half your advertising works, but you don't know which half it is. And like the, 
like the whole goal of the ad system that we built was that it was very transparent and you only paid for the parts that work. And that was just, that just made sense. And with, of course, on a digital platform, you can track everything in a way that you can have an understanding, like, did this work or did it not work? Was this user interested in the product? And so, uh, I, I mean, I would extrapolate from that um, and say that it's important to remember how much opportunity there is and how much the world is being changed and that you don't always need to be an expert in that specific area to be able to to work in it that a lot of times there are new areas and you can apply logic and think about yourself as a user yourself as a consumer like what would you want how can things be done differently um, and that actually goes a really long way in terms of understanding um, how things can how how that product can evolve and so I wouldn't just assume like, oh, it's all been figured out. Everybody knows all the answers. Like you're you're new to the field. You don't know anything. Like, no, you, everyone's new. And so you can come in and think about what makes sense and like understand that the clientele really quickly or the product and um and and probably have some really good suggestions and um ways that it that it can be built and improved. I love I love that that line of thinking and and it reminds me of other decisions that that you had made. You you didn't kind of grow up as a young child and see yourself as a technologist. You actually thought you were going to become an, a PhD in economics and got got your master's. And then you sort of had a fork in the road and and you you know you decided to to go after this career in tech. Then you did it again. You were at kind of a, a stable career, and then the startup that was being built in your garage, you know, with no revenue and no you know, no users, but you decided to go for it. And then there's this kind of pivotal meeting between you and Eric Schmidt after the acquisition, years after the acquisition of YouTube. And you described it where he said something like, so, you know, what do you think about YouTube? <laughs> Without <laughs> even like giving you a chance to prepare. But you described, you described yourself leaning into that opportunity and telling him in that moment that you were really excited about it. And it reminded me of a comment from another woman executive, Ronnie Johnson. She said, if someone tells you that you should be president of the United States, you should say send Air Force One. You know, <laughs> and that like with your the way you just like leaned into YouTube and becoming the CEO, it feels like you were just willing to go after it. And, you know, and I love for, for our audience in particular, sometimes going after opportunities where they don't have the conventional experience or the conventional background, but be willing to have a new narrative about who they are and what they're capable of. And I see that as a theme in your career to date. Definitely, definitely. I, I do think it's it's important to remember, I mean, first of all, I think veterans have many, many important skills. Um, you know, you've served your country, you've learned a lot of, you've done hard missions, you've worked under stress, um, you've worked in, um, you, you, uh, like you have worked as a team, which is really, really important. And you bring a valuable perspective and, you know, all companies want to have people who come from all different, um, backgrounds because we know that having diverse groups lead to better products. And so I really would. I would recognize that you have a lot to give companies and uh, be willing to be excited of, you know, about what's, you know, what's right for you. If you find something that you're interested in, that you think it would be a good area for you, like it's good, good to show that excitement. I, I like to hire people who are excited to be at our company because I know that it's going to take a lot of work and time and dedication. And if they're excited and I see that and they come prepared and, um, express their commitment, then, then I know that, um, I know they're going to, I know it's going to work out because it's the, the knowledge, it's not like everyone needs to have the knowledge to already do the job. Most people don't have the knowledge to do the job. Um, they've maybe done similar or other types of jobs, but because there's so much change in our industry and it's so dynamic, everybody is learning. And so getting someone who's willing to learn, willing to change and be, you know, there and work hard is, is really, really valuable. And, mm -hmm. um, and like, you know, so, you know, you referenced the, the point where they asked me like, Oh, would you like to be CEO of YouTube? And I realized like in that moment I had to decide I had to, and I was like, yes, of course. Like I, I love YouTube. I want to be part of YouTube. Um, and, and so, you know, I think it's great that to definitely, you know, express your excitement and 
commitment and willingness to work hard. And that means a lot right there. Um, and, and I know that employers will be really interested in seeing that commitment and excitement. Mm-hmm. And one of the things that, that you were referencing is the, the excitement and the commitment, not just in, in what my friend Lexi Reese has described as the green shoot times, but, but when it's hard, building these companies is hard and complicated. It was hard in that one moment where you were advocating for Google to acquire YouTube. And it was an unpopular decision at the time. There was a lot of friction around that decision and whether or not to go for it. What made you push through those dissenting opinions, you know, and really push for the acquisition, which again, many years later has been called the best acquisition of all time. How did you, how did you kind of stick with your conviction that it was the right thing for the company to do? Yeah, well, I've had many, many hard times. Um, and that, that was, that was a while ago, but there's certainly been many challenges since. And, you know, I think it's important to, to have your North Star and understand a, like, where do you think the world is going and where is your company going? And um, I had a very clear view on it that I saw that digital video was going to be a big thing. It turned out that it is a really big thing. And now many companies are really leaning into digital video. And I saw the value of user generated content. Um, and I was convinced that was going to be that was going to be the future. And so at the end of the day, I have to be true to myself. So if that's what I see as the future, and that's the conviction I have, then I need to express it and, and represent that point of view. And it's my job, in terms of trying to do the best for the company to share what I know, even if that's an unpopular position and do the right thing for the users. And actually one, one point of view that, that Google has, I think has been really helpful is a very, being a very user focused company. And so that actually helps in many ways in terms of not seeming like you're being political. And you know, if you're disagreeing with your manager, you're disagreeing with other people around the room, like you're all just trying to work for the customers. You're all just trying to do what's the right thing for the company and your users. And um, and you can debate about it uh, um, and have differences of opinion, and that's okay. And um, in the end, you know, the group will decide, and you all, you know, as a team, move on to whatever was decided by the group um, or the the leader at the time, and and that's okay. And so I've always had that point of view that I just need to represent what's the right thing for our user base, and even if it's not popular opinion, then I'm going to say it. Sometimes I might not say it right there because I want to be respectful. And there may be times I may go say it afterwards, like one-on-one -on -one or in a different environment where, um, but I will always make sure that my point of view is heard and that I'm being true to myself and true to the people that I'm there to represent. And is it, so I'm thinking about this high stakes conversation, people who, who obviously are respectful of each other, but with really different viewpoints about what to do. And you had 15 minutes to build the financial model <laughs> in support of the acquisition. <laughs> Is that right? Was it 15 minutes or an hour or something? Well, it was really, sh I mean, I think I spent like an hour on it and I didn't really realize that. Yeah, so I, I built this model showing that YouTube, how much YouTube was worth. And I only had like an hour and I showed it to our founders, I believe. And anyway, later I had to show it to the board and I wasn't like, I didn't prepare, have spent that much time preparing it. So, I mean, sometimes the thing is, is that with, with business, a lot of times you're making a decision. You're mm -hmm. making a decision, even if you're not bidding on YouTube, you're making a decision. You're making a decision not to bid for it, not to pay for it. Um, and there was some amount, if you're going to buy it, you know, there's some amount you have to bid for it. And so sometimes having imperfect information and doing the best that you can is better than having no information, right? And so, I was, my information and my model was not perfect, but it was good enough to show that this was, was worth the, the price that, that, you know, was able to purchase it in the end. And, um, and of course, like, you know, it was probably worth more now that we've Google and YouTube has, have been invested so much. It's worth a lot more now, but, um, but it was, it was the best guess at the time. And, and that was good enough. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And have any of those um, those folks who disagreed, did they have they circle back to you and <laughs> said you were right? Well, there's lots of, you know, there's I mean, this is I think it's good to move on. I, I, I think there's always going to be disagreement and there are times I'm right and there are times I'm wrong and, and we all are learning. And, and that's just 
the way the position that I think is good to mm. have is like, we're all learning, we're all doing the best we can to work in a rapidly changing dynamic environment. And um, yeah, and I mean, I think people, people see where the trends are going. And they, you know, sure, I, I mean, I think afterwards, people said, yeah, that was like a good, good decision. Glad, glad we glad we bought it. That's wonderful. And you you talked about just being in a dynamic environment and YouTube is is a dynamic company making decisions also in a dynamic environment. You and the team that you work with are in a really unique position right now to make history and to shape the future of free expression. You've talked about the importance of freedom of speech and and how to kind of balance the line between protecting freedom and protecting users of the platform. Could you share more about your philosophy in this regard? Sure. Um, well, so first of all, we we definitely YouTube stands for enabling people to um, you know post video, um, share their voice, and we really want to enable everyone to have that freedom of expression. Um, on the other hand, we also have community guidelines, and those community guidelines are there for many reasons. Which is that, you know, first of all, we want to make sure that our um, we want to make sure that uh, there's content that might not be appropriate for our community. So, for example, very early on, like literally, like within the first week that YouTube um, and existed, like there were decisions made about adult content that that would not be appropriate for the community. It's legal, but it's not appropriate for that community. Um, and then there certainly are going to be other decisions that we're going to wind up making um, to, for our community guidelines and, um, to make sure that you know we're doing what's appropriate for our community and also preventing real world harm. And so those are you know, as we as YouTube has gotten bigger and bigger, the consequences of those decisions have become more important. Um, and we've also seen the need to really refine that. And so we've spent a lot of time consulting with experts, understanding where's the right place to draw those lines um, to both make sure that we can give the freedom of expression, enable you know, everyone to have a voice, um, but also at the same time, keep our community safe um, and prevent any kind of real world harm. Thank you, Susan. And I wanted to continue along this um, general topic line. Sure. Misinformation is a hot topic, um, especially within the, the YouTube platform um, and at Google more broadly. And it wasn't always the case. You know, when, when you all acquired the company, that was, that was not something that was kind of top of mind for people thinking about the future of video. Can you take us back to when these problems first arose on the platform and how you've led the team and the business through creating and refining those policies over time? Yeah. Well, so you know, when YouTube first started out, it was definitely seen as a smaller platform in the sense that we had like, and, and more entertainment focused, right? Um, and so like initially YouTube was famous for like cat videos and um, people uploading cute things that they saw like, you know, happen in their family. And, and so there was just um, really more focus on, on entertainment. But as it grew, it became a lot more clear that there was, um, you know, YouTube got, became more in the information area. Um, and so it was really around 2017, 2018 that we started seeing YouTube playing a much stronger role here. And there was more risk of people posting false information. And, um, and so, you know, there were a number of different events that happened. Um, there were, um, there were various attacks where people had accused, you know, YouTube playing a role and that's like, was never our intention, never that we wanted to be part of that. There was accusations around like how violent extremism was, uh, and violent extremist groups were using YouTube. Right. And we always had clear rules around that. But what we saw is, is that groups were becoming much, much more sophisticated. And so they weren't necessarily sure if there was um, clear information coming from any kind of um, group that, you know, that we knew um, was associated with a violent extremism group, that would be content that we would remove. But there were, we saw that, that our content was being used in like a more sophisticated way where people would have like, maybe like um, more kind of like a dog whistle kind of, text or it would be used in a in a 
way that we didn't necessarily intend. And that's where we realized like, wow, we really need to get a lot of experts who are in, get those experts to help advise us to understand how do we revise those policies? How do we make sure that we are doing the right thing? Um, and that's, so we tightened some of our policies with regard to content that we allow on our platform. But then we also focus on really, when it comes to information topics, raising up the valuable information. So if you, for example, type in like a medical information, you want to see that from experts. Like if you just want to learn about the latest song, you're like fine seeing like the latest musician who just like posted a song yesterday that maybe is like, you know, the new hot latest musician that's only been out and is relatively new on the scene. But that's not true if you have cancer. If you have cancer, like you want to go to the expert, you want to go to, you know, the National Cancer Institute or Mayo Clinic or a well-known university um, hospital. And so that's when we started really making sure that we had for sensitive topics that we were raising up um, information that came from trusted sources to make sure that our users were getting the right information. Mm -hmm. One of the one of the other things that I've heard you say is you just refuse to allow people to build businesses based on hate mm -hmm. on YouTube. W will you talk a little bit about how you prevent that from happening? Yeah, well, first of all, hate is a is a complicated topic because you know different groups can define that differently. And so we want to be sensitive and and when we when we talk about hate and when we made a our last update to the hate policy, we spoke to dozens of groups like across all aisles of the of the spectrum, like just to make sure that we were able to hear all different perspectives um, and all different groups and understand that like, you know, that hate manifests in many different ways that we wouldn't have necessarily thought of. Um, also, we're a global platform. And so there could be you know, a variety of different issues that happen in Asia Pacific or in Latin America that we're not necessarily as sensitive to. Um, I mean, our employees there are, but we want to make sure that our policies are global policies and they reflect that. And so really, you know, as we, what, what we want to do, so as we update those policies, you know, our goal is to, um, we have a number of different criteria. Um, I think they're like 13, 12 or 13 protected groups, whether it's like religion, gender, race, um, immigration status, um, and you can't use any of those characteristics to justify discrimination, separation, violence, et cetera. Um, and that was, that was um, a policy that we have taken a really strong line on. And it's because we, you know, YouTube is a global platform. We want to represent um, and enable all communities to feel safe. And in order to do that, we have to have policies that are reflective um, that represent all groups and enforce them consistently around the world. Mm -hmm. um, one of the one of the things that I loved hearing you say at one point, you said something like, "You know, I'm really focused on living without regrets, and I'm really focused on living a multifaceted life," which I thought was a really beautiful way to kind of encapsulate your, you know, how you think about your days and how you think about your weeks, months, years, and what you're trying to accomplish in, in a comprehensive way. But when you reflect on your career, what are you most proud of? And what are the biggest lessons that you've learned along the way? I'd say what I'm most proud of is when people tell us that the products that we've built have made their life better in some way. And um, I think at the end of the day, that's what really drives me at YouTube and what dri drives me at Google is, and, and that's like, that's what I, one of the things I just love about technology is like you create products, you launch them, and then people all around the world write back to you literally sometimes within minutes telling you what they thought about what you did and how they used it. And, and that for me has been the most compelling aspect of it. And so you know, many features that we worked on at Google, that I've worked on at Google, whether it was Google image search um, or our AdSense products that enabled people to have a living to, you know, creating um, content about what they loved um, or like YouTube, like, I love meeting with creators and they tell me about how they created their um, channel, how they have viewers, how they're able to generate a, a living, employ people based on their channel. And 
Um, and then I also have people who come and they tell me about something they learned on YouTube. And that's also really compelling to me about just the way YouTube could, could help them get through a hard moment or learn a skill or get a job or um, um, learn so many things that are out there and it's free. So mm -hmm. that for me at the end of the day is what drives me and keeps me motivated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you for sharing. And I want to turn it over now. We, we have a number of questions from our audience, which I'll go ahead and ask on their behalf. Um, Queen and Keenan had similar questions around risk. And they said, I'm curious about her approach to accepting and taking risks. Over the years, she has taken a number of significant risks, being, number, being employee number 16, facilitating one of the largest acquisitions in history. Um, and even earlier in your career, the risk between going with the, the route that you felt you knew best to, you know, to get your PhD in economics versus this sort of untested path into tech. Um, so Queen and Keenan are asking, how do you balance risk and reward and encourage your team to do so as well? Definitely. So, um, so I'll, I'll add a little color. When I joined Google, when I was employee 16, I had a lot of debt because I was still in business school and I was pregnant. Um, so I actually, in retrospect, was taking a lot of risk. But I mean, it sounds like I'm taking a lot of risk, but at the time I didn't feel like I was taking any risk. Cause I was like, this is a great company. This company is creating a wonderful product and of course I'm going to join. And I actually was working at Intel, which is a big established company at the time. And, uh, I felt that it made sense. So because I saw the opportunity and so I, I do take risks, but the, the risks are calculated because I try to predict what's going to happen in the future and think like, how does this decision play out based on my view of where the world is going. And my view was that the internet was taking off. I had to be part of it, that this company was growing it had unique technology. And even though it had no revenue now, it would have revenue in the future. Um, and even if it didn't do that well, like it, someone would buy it and, you know, it would be okay. Um, so that was, that was my calculation there. Um, uh, it's similar when we make business decisions or there's risk, that, um, from that perspective, it's, it's similar where we have a view of like, this is how the future, what the future is going to look like in three to five years. We don't know a hundred percent, but we know more or less, these are the trend lines and this is where the future is going. And based on that, you know, what it, what are the likely outcomes? And if you do it that way then the, the, and you measure it and you have a view of that future, the, the risks don't seem like big risks anymore. They seem like, oh yes, of course, this is what we need to do because this is where the world's going and this is how we'll be prepared for that future world. So um, I would recommend to you know, think not just about the present time, but have some view about where the puck is going and what the future holds and then extrapolate, almost work backwards from there and say like, based on that future, you know, what should you be doing now to be in the best situation for the next couple of years? Mm -hmm. Thank you, Susan. And we have a question from one of our veterans who says, you've clearly had a stellar trajectory and great impact in your career. You started with an arts degree in history from Harvard. And so the trajectory seems like it, it started in an un, um, unlikely way. Did you always want to be a CEO or did that desire develop later in your career? And what advice do you have for someone who may have had an unlikely start like a veteran? And this is from Kelly. Yeah. So I didn't initially really think about being a CEO when I first started out. I was actually what drove me to tech was I liked just creating things. And so like as a kid and a college student, I was always interested in making things and art projects, photography or, or any kind of any kind of um, art. But what I saw in technology was I saw this ability to be able to create and to build and that was really high impact for me. And so my senior year in college, I 
took a computer science class, which was really unusual because most people usually, you know, I was in a class with a bunch of freshmen. And so that's also another message. Like, I don't think it's ever too late. Like at the time I was like, oh, it's too late. Like I, I'm too old. I can't switch now to technology. Um, I'm 21 or whatever it was. Right. And of course, of course you can change. And of course you can learn. And there are lots of people who, who take a technology class and then, um, you know, can, can do a lot of things with that. So I took this computer science class for computer science major. And then I was like, wow, I like technology. I'm going to keep working, um, in it. I, I did have a few like zigzags. Um, like I was like, oh, maybe I'll go to economics too. I was kind of confused about where I want to go. Um, and so I, again, I, I think that, um, because it's, it is a changing field that people can learn and, um, come into the field. And in many ways, it's benefited me to have a more like a multi um, disciplinary background. When I think about problems, it's, it's beneficial. I can see that from multiple perspectives. And again, I think veterans, I think you all bring a lot of really valuable skills. Um, I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of valuable um, experiences and backgrounds that you have and, and companies and employers will recognize that the ability to work as a team under stress, um, to serve a mission I mean, and dedication that it takes to be a veteran. So I really see a lot of benefits that you have and you just need to like believe in yourself, invest in yourself and then um, go for it. Mm -hmm. We actually have a veteran on your team at YouTube. Her name is Gabby Along, and um, and I know that she just loves being being part of the tribe. Um, and Susan, your your comments remind me of um, Carol Dweck and the growth mindset. Um, she's a Stanford professor. Your father was also a professor at Stanford. Did that experience growing up on on the Stanford campus? Did it? Does that contribute to this this outlook that you have that that things can be learned that you can grow into opportunities that um, that it's possible to um, to really uh, fully um, grow into the full extent of your potential? Growing up on the campus definitely impacted me a lot, and I'd say the way that it influenced me the most is just looking for interesting opportunities and. It, it, Stanford professors are usually, I, and I grew up on the campus, so everyone, all my neighbors were professors, and they were just a fascinating group of people because they had all excelled in something or in a field, and they had chosen academia um, and the pursuit of this area that they were so interested in over a lot of times going to industry where they could have made more money um, or... Um, you know, and, and really valued the, the knowledge for the knowledge sake and giving back to the community. And so that definitely stuck with me in the sense that I just wanted to do something that was interesting. I, when I joined, I wasn't like looking for like, oh, you know, where do I go and generate the most revenue or have the highest salary? I was just looking for like, what is interesting? Where can I give back? And if you do something interesting and you're giving back to the community and you do something useful, like usually that has a lot of benefits one way or another. And so it, I, it's, it, it's, but it, I do think it's useful to think about it from that other perspective. Like what can you do that's valuable to society that you're interested in, that is you know, interesting for, for you to learn more about. Um, and that was sort of the way I approached it. And I realized I didn't answer your question about CEO. I, I didn't really think I was going to be a CEO. EO initially, but what I mm -hmm. found is that when I was working in the products, like initially I, I created a product as a more junior employee and I thought it was a great product. The product didn't do that well. And then I realized, wow, this is really multidisciplinary. I need to know about the marketing and the way it was, you know, it was sold, um, not just like how the product was actually created. And I started realizing like, oh, there are all these other parts. I need to go to, you know, business school and learn about all of these other ways that you approach a product and its success. And that's when I realized, wow, I, I'm like thinking more like, oh, I want to be like the CEO. And I, I remember actually the first time like telling someone that and they were like, oh, uh, <laughs> um, that's a surprise. And I was just like, yeah, but that's the way I think. I just like, I want to have a, that larger picture and understand what's needed. And, um, you know, but on the other hand, like I was willing to do whatever roles there were along the company, but I kind of always like, 
came back to like, this is like the bigger picture. This is where we need to go. So even, you know, in other roles, I would give advice of like thinking strategically about what are the important areas for us as a company and how to think about the environment, the product, the, you know, all these other multidisciplinary approaches to have success. Mm -hmm. And that that's so true about your career. And even the YouTube acquisition is an example of that because you advise the company to buy it, but then you weren't immediately involved in it right after the no, acquisition. You I wasn't, I advised them to buy it. And then they're like, no, we need you to run ads. So I was like, okay, I guess I'll run ads. <laughs> I mean, I was excited about it, but it, it also, um, you know, at the end of the day, I would just, and I'm, I, I have to do what's the right thing for the company and where I can be most helpful and work as a team player. And I'm really glad I worked in advertising. I believe I learned a lot. Um, and when I say work in advertising, people always think like I was selling ads. Like, no, I, I worked and designed the systems and worked with the teams that built the systems. And I believe that was really helpful. YouTube is an ad supported platform. So really understanding how advertising works is very valuable. Um, it does help us in terms of managing the economics of the business. And so, you know, there's always a reason why you maybe took a detour one way or another, and it comes back in that multidisciplinary approach of seeing um, different businesses and have different experiences can be really valuable. Mm -hmm. And you've talked about a, a key element in your success, which is, you know, leaning forward into these opportunities as, as they present themselves and, and really having a bias for yes, where it makes sense. Colin has a question for you. He says, as someone who's been at the forefront of defining and addressing the market potential of Google from day one, if you could name just one key ingredient, what would you define as the most important element of Google's long-term success into turning that market potential into reality? Well, one is really hard. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, if I had to choose one, I would say the fact that you, that Google was user user oriented. And mm -hmm. at the time, search was not a user oriented. People were doing a lot of things like saying, oh, we'll manipulate the search results for money. Um, so we will like change what you see in the search results if you pay us. That was the mm -hmm. standard practice. And Google, because it was very focused on doing what's right for its users, it said, we're never going to do that. And we're going to deliver the right results and we're going to measure it and we're going to get better and better at that. And so that in the end led to a lot of a lot of the success of everything we do. It's also led to the success of the advertising system. Like with our advertising, we also said, hey, we're not just gonna take the most amount of money. The ads are gonna be relevant to the queries. They're gonna be related to what our users are looking into. Um, we're gonna give them transparency to see whether or not like their users actually you know, clicked on it um, and get, give them the right metrics to see if that was a good use of, of funds. And so all of that user center focus translated into building a right product, which I believe in the end, you know, led to Google's, a lot of Google's success. They also had a mm -hmm. lot of like good technologists to be able to execute that. So if I had to choose a second, that would be the second is, is to be able to build the right product and have the good technology behind it. Mm -hmm. But, you know, the technology alone wouldn't have solved it. You had mm -hmm. to have the desire and build to build the right product and how to have that fill a real consumer need. Mm -hmm. uh, Reed Hoffman described this as Google's true north when he when he interviewed you. Um, I'm going to try to squeeze in two more questions because we had yeah. so, so much interest from the Breakline audience. And yeah. there was a question that Lexi, Sophia, Chris, and Pierce all had a version of this. And it's, how would you respond to critics who suggest that YouTube limits free speech and debate by suspending accounts or deplatforming people for content deemed offensive or inappropriate or for misinformation? How do you respond to, to those critics? Yeah, well, I definitely, I definitely have heard that criticism, um, and there's definitely a lot of debate about where's the right line and where do you draw that. Um, and I would say, first of all, like we want to lean in as much as we can to free speech, and we believe the internet has brought a lot of new voices, and that's inc incredibly valuable, and that is very, very important to YouTube. But on the other hand, um, we need to do the right thing to make sure that we're keeping our community safe. So let's just talk about COVID, for example, which I think is a, an example. 
um, COVID information um, is and, and COVID information and COVID misinformation. Um, it, we wanted to make sure that we are working with medical experts and um, adhering to what medical experts was telling us was um, the most important thing for people to be seeing. So um, there was a lot of misinformation that was actually sometimes causing real world damage. So there was a period of time where people were saying that 5G caused COVID or that COVID was not due to a virus. It was due to 5G or due to something else. Um, now that has real world implications for our hospitals, for public health officials. People were destroying equipment of telecommunication towers. Um, and so <clears throat> that's a place where on consultation with a lot of experts, it was clear that saying COVID comes from something other than a virus, which no medical group like believes it comes from something other than a virus. Um, that's where we would have a policy and we would remove content if people said that. Um, and, you know, we need to be consistent. We work really, really hard to enforce those policies consistently um, across all users, no matter who they are, uh, and make sure that, you know, we're very clear with our users what those policies are. And, um, and also like, you know, we need to make sure that we are being responsible ultimately. And that leads in the end to like, also us as a business, like we're, you know, ultimately, YouTube is a business, and if we have a lot of content on our platform that is believed to lead lead to real world harm, like a, we would never want to do that. Um, but it also causes a business issue for us, meaning that we're not going to have advertisers, and if we don't have advertisers, then we can't pay our content creators, and then they can't make a living on YouTube anymore. They're small businesses, so uh, we need to strike this balance where we give as much freedom of speech as we possibly can, but be responsible and know, make sure that we're keeping the community safe. And the best way we see to do that is to consult with experts in the field and, um, and to implement that as consistently as we possibly can. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Susan. Lightning round question as we wrap up here. Okay. You're, you're obviously a leader on the world stage today. But you were a leader even when you joined Google as the 16th employee. I mean, you you ended up driving and making and advocating for some of the most consequential decisions that the company took at the time. And we have a community full of leaders here, um, some who are at the very early stages of their careers. Thoughts for them in order to, to really grow into their fullest potential as you have? I mean, I would just encourage you all to uh, to like, think about what you're interested in, think about where you believe the world is going, where you believe there's growth and invest in yourselves as much as you can in terms of learning and getting the skills. Like you might not have all the skills you read you'd have right need right now, but you can take a class. Um, you can find experts who are in the field who can advise you what you should do to be more successful in that area and um and just not give up i mean i would encourage you to just be persistent like that's also something at the end of the day like i'm hardworking and persistent and it has not been easy for me it hasn't been easy for anyone but i just i just keep keep doing it. i just keep waking up every day and coming back and figuring out like how do i how do i do this better how do i learn how do i get better and i encourage uh you to to just keep trying. And I'm confident that if you're working hard and trying and getting, investing in yourself, like ultimately you will get further in whatever it is that you're pursuing. Susan, thank you so much. In addition to Gabby along, our alum, Nicole Carter is also part of your team at YouTube. We know it's a very special place to be okay. under your leadership. So delighted that we had the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you so much, Bethany. Thank you so much, Breakline. I'm glad to be here and best of luck to everybody.